where this story is headed. Jesus ultimately is going to die. He will be buried and he will be resurrected. Um, and as the gentleman saying for us today, um, sometimes it's good for us to ponder um, why Jesus died, why he suffered, and the fact of his resurrection. And so I think it is important, though, that we look at some of the circumstances that lead to Jesus' death and what it says about people in general, what it says about sin, and even what it says about ourselves. And so as you're turning there, I want you to uh, enter into it in this way. There's a story about a retired doctor who sold everything that he had and gave most of it away, and he set up practice living by himself in a room just above a liquor store in a very poor neighborhood. And he wanted to live out his days offering free health care to as many people as he possibly could. And so the same space that he lived in, he also would see patients. And the only advertising that he needed was a small sign that was out in front of that liquor store that said, Dr. Williams is upstairs. And people knew they could go up the stairs, knock on the door, and almost inevitably he would be able to care for them in some day. Well, the day came when this doctor died and he had no family and had not saved any money even for his own funeral. And so the people in this neighborhood, although they had very little, scraped together enough money to pay for a modest funeral and burial. But they lacked enough money to pay for a real headstone for this. And for a time, it looked as if his grave would just go unmarked. But then someone had an idea and they took that sign that was in front of that liquor store and attached it to a post over his grave. And to this day, that grave says, Dr. Williams is upstairs. <laughs> in this chapter, it appears that very shortly, and if you know the story, that Jesus is headed upstairs. He is going to return to his heavenly father. But... He doesn't want to leave us absent of the impact of his life and ultimately his death for us as believers even to this day. And so I want to walk through this story. We won't read it verse for verse. We just want to look at about 10 verses. But as we go through it, I want you to notice just some very obvious things I think here. First and foremost is we want to see the, the hypocrisy that comes out of the sinful hearts that those would, that would do harm to Jesus. Mostly these religious people are still at the forefront, though, although this part of Jesus' trial, we mentioned last week, I think in the week before, that there is a religious aspect for which Jesus is put on trial in front of the Jewish officials. That part is ending just where we pick up today in verse 28. And now they're moving to the civil part of his trial. And you'll see... Uh, this just drips with hypocrisy in the hearts of those who would bring Jesus. And so as we begin in verse 28, it says, Then the Jewish leaders took Jesus from Caiaphas, that was the high priest, to the place of the Roman governor. And we'll see that his name shortly is Pontius Pilate. And it says, By now it was early morning. So, these people now have concluded the religious trial. And if it's now early morning, when did that religious trial take place? In the middle of the night. I'm not sure if I, there used to be a sitcom on TV called Night Court um, where they brought people in the middle of the night for small uh, crimes and things. But um, there's something, I, I think a reason most courts don't take place in the middle of the night is that it's meant to be an open forum for people to know how justice is being carried out. And we are very clearly to see that these men who brought Jesus before the religious officials there, they did it at night because they wanted it to have the veil of secrecy. It was a dark thing happening in the veil of darkness. And probably what took place here, if we read the other Gospels, is that Jesus was taken before Annas, who was the father of the high priest, then taken to Caiaphas, the high priest, and probably uh, went back and forth. And that early morning, there was this mockery of a trial that took place to make it official. And so the very end of this trial did take place, probably after daylight, in which uh, business could be conducted. But they were railroading Jesus to his demise. And the Jewish leaders had long plotted to kill Jesus. This Jesus who had claimed 
uh, that he could forgive sins, that he was the Messiah. All those I am statements that we read uh, throughout the Gospel of John leading up to this is Jesus' own testimony that he was the Messiah. And these religious leaders, not believing that to be the case, wanted to charge him with blasphemy and false claims against the Jewish religion. But notice what happens when they bring him now to Pilate. They want Pilate to do their dirty work. They wanted this to all happen in the middle of the night, but they wanted now the Romans to carry out ultimately the murder of Christ. And listen to what it says there at the end of verse 28. To avoid ceremonial uncleanness, they did not enter the palace because they wanted to eat the Passover. Do you see the irony in that statement? These men who are railroading Jesus to, towards his own death are afraid of ceremonial uncleanness so they can carry out what they believe is the letter of the law. They're afraid of breaking the law by entering the home or the palace of this Gentile, Pilate, that would make them unclean. Several things we need to note here. First of all, there is no Old Testament law that says a Jew is made unclean by entering the house of a Gentile. So this is one of many examples that these religious people are more concerned with religiosity than they are their own faith. And not only are they zealous for the letter of the law, but they've even added to it. Not out of holiness or any sense of righteousness, but so that they could be puffed up in the sight of others that could say, not only do we keep the law, we even keep the laws we made up to make it even more difficult. They paid attention to the minute details of religion while their hearts were far from God. Now before we're too hard on these people, let's let the scripture shine a light on our own lives. Are we ever guilty of that same sin? That we're more concerned with the letter of the law as far as people could see in us and our hearts could be far from God? Is even our attendance at a worship service sometimes to be able to check that box off so that people will know I'm really serious about this thing, but our hearts are far from the worship of God? So these people are more concerned with legalism than they are with faith in God. But they also come seeking vigilante justice from this ruler that they have such disdain for that they won't even enter into his palace. Is there even more irony in that? We want you to punish one for breaking the laws of our religion, but we don't want to touch you with a 10-foot pole. I won't even walk in your house, but could you take care of this for me? And it says they didn't want to be unclean so that they could eat the Passover. If you're unfamiliar with what the Passover is, it's a feast that was celebrated um, for uh, over a week every year. And it commemorated, it celebrated one of God's greatest acts of grace and mercy for his people. It was when the people of Israel were enslaved in Egypt and they cried out to God and God raised up Moses to be uh, that deliverer. And Moses goes before Pharaoh and says to let my people go. And Pharaoh refuses and it takes 10 plagues to convince the Pharaoh to finally and ultimately let these people go. And God demonstrates his own power and sovereignty, not, over his, not only over his people, but even over the Egyptian people. And it's that final terrible night that the Passover refers to. The last plague was a plague upon the people that the firstborn of every household would be killed, except for those who would put the blood of a lamb upon the doorpost. And as the angel of the Lord passed over all those, primarily the Israelites who were obedient to God, had placed that blood upon their door, and the angel passed over those houses and the firstborn was taken from all the other houses. And finally, Pharaoh relents and lets those people go. And in the celebration of the Passover, there are several meals that are celebrated within that. And these people are zealous to be clean in order to celebrate that great event in the lives of the Jewish people. And so in carrying out this murder... They are careful not to become ceremonial, ceremonially 
unclean. And so they hand Jesus off to be murdered by another so that they're clean. Their hearts couldn't be further from God. Their minds clouded by their own religiosity and sets of rules and regulations that they don't recognize the promised Messiah when he's there. And the irony is this. It is that they lead Jesus bound by his hands. We mentioned this last week. Jesus, who is the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. It is in celebrating that Passover, the shedding of blood was meant to point to the Messiah who would shed his own blood for these people. And yet they carry out this travesty of justice under the cover of darkness initially and now into the light they want to pass him over to another. It's these people who kept the letter of the Passover law while carrying out the murder of the one who would fulfill that law. Pilate asked a legitimate question. He's a Roman ruler. He's a governor of this territory. And the way the Romans governed is they wanted you to live your own life, do your own thing, practice your own religion. As long as you gave enough money to Rome and kept the peace, then we'll let you do your own thing. And so when these people come to him and say, we want you to execute this man, verse 30 says, he asked this question, what charges are you bringing against this man? Now notice more irony in their answer. Does it say what the charges are? Their answer is this. If he were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. They don't want a trial. They want an execution. When he says, what has he done? They know he's not committed any crime against the law. In fact, Jesus was zealous to uphold the civil law, even giving taxes to Caesar in the midst of that. What he has done is broken what they saw as religious laws by claiming to be God incarnate, by claiming to be really the king of the Jews. That question will come up by Pilate in a minute. But what treachery and what travesty of justice are these people trying to carry out? Are there any charges? They don't bother with the details. They just say, he's a criminal. In fact, some of your translations will say, he's an evildoer. That terrible Jesus, all the terrible things he's done. Does that hold up? Those of you who are in the legal profession here, when you go to court and the judge says, what is this person charged with? And you say, he's guilty, he's an evildoer. Evil and the judge says, oh, well, in that case, let's just move right on to the sentencing. There's no charge against him and they know it. And they want to put pressure on Pilate and say, don't rock the boat here. If you want these Jewish people to be content and happy and peaceful, just do what we ask you to do. They know Jesus hadn't broken any of these Roman laws. And it doesn't seem that Pilate's too interested in getting involved in these religious squabbles. In fact, verse 31, he says, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. He says, you handle your own business. Why are you involving me in a religious matter? Verse 31, they say again, but we have no right to execute anyone which was only partially true. In a civil sense, they didn't have the right to execute anyone, but in just a, a short time after Jesus' death and resurrection, they take it upon themselves to stone Stephen in the public court. And probably wasn't the first time that had happened. But I think the timing and place of this is such that they don't want to do that because Jesus was wildly popular. You remember just a day or two before this trial, it was Jesus who was riding into Jerusalem on that donkey and people came out in throngs and said, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they laid their coats and their palm leaves and celebrated this coming king. So I think the Jews were not so zealous to uphold the law, but they were afraid of the people. They could have stoned him right there in the garden of Gethsemane. But they wanted the Romans to do it so no one would protest. But something even greater is at work here, and it's a reminder of who's really in charge here. Remember when we said that they bound Jesus' hands? Was it that they were afraid that he was going to hurt somebody, that he was going to run off, or he was going to fight to the death? Absolutely not. Jesus went willingly 
told Peter to put up the sword. We're not fighting this battle. Verse 32 says something very telling for us here, though. It says, this took place. In other words, the Romans being asked to, to do this execution, it says it took place to fulfill what Jesus had said about the kind of death he was going to die. Jesus on more than one occasion has said that the Son of Man, referring to himself, would be lifted up. And John chapter 3 tells Nicodemus, who is one of these leaders of the Jewish religion, he said, just as the serpent in the desert, that image that was lifted up on a pole to heal those for, who were dying from snake bites, he says, so the Son of Man will be lifted up. He was referring to a crucifixion, the suffering and the death. If he had been stoned, it would have meant the prophecies were wrong. All the way back, not just in Jesus' word, but in the Old Testament. Psalm 22 says his hands and his feet would be pierced. Stoning wouldn't have accomplished the prophecies. It would have made it all a lie. And so even in the treachery that's at hand here, God's purposes are going forward. The truth is being testified to. It was always God's plan for his son to come and live and die for his people. And so now it's being accomplished even in the blackness of this deed that's being done. So what are these two important questions now? Jesus now comes, they bring him there. Uh, the, the Jewish leaders won't go into Pilate's chambers. And so he summons Jesus and he comes. The very first words out of Pilate's mouth to Jesus are these. Are you the king of of the Jews. Now you'd surely been told this by these people that Je Jesus was claiming to be the king of the Jews. They wanted Pilate to see this as a challenge to his authority and ultimately to Caesar's authority. But it doesn't appear that Pilate thinks much of Jesus. He looks at this man in peasant's clothes whose hands are bound, who had already been slapped in his face, possibly showing signs of being beaten already. And he says, are you the king of the Jews. Verse 36, Jesus says, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. Jesus says his kingdom is from God, not from men. And his kingship is exercised over the spiritual lives of people, not over this small piece of property in the Middle East. And Jesus adds, everyone on the sides of truth listens to me. We enter into the kingdom of God by faith. His kingship is over those who acknowledge Jesus to be who he is. And Pilate, and depending on your translation, sometimes there's a question mark here. Sometimes there's an exclamation point, but he says something like, you're a king then, either mockingly or questioningly. You're a king then? You're a king then. And Jesus says, you say that I'm a king, but actually better translated, some of your translations will say, you are correct in saying that I am a king. Jesus says very clearly that I am who I claim to be. And he doesn't deny the fact that he is this king, but Pilate seems to be satisfied that he's not a challenger to the throne of Caesar. He has something much bigger in mind, but Pilate doesn't see it as a threat. And then he asks him this. Jesus goes on to say uh, that he has come to this world for the specific purpose. He was born into this world to testify to that truth. And Pilate asks this second question. What is truth? And when we land here this morning, that question is still before us every day of our lives. What is truth? You see, we live in a world today, we live in a time that's really given up truth for what's called relativism or even humanism it might be referred to. It's squarely put the arbiter of truth in our own hearts and our own minds. And we live in a world today where people are zealous to say, you can believe what you believe and I'll believe what I want to believe and I won't tell you about what you should believe and you don't tell me about what I should believe. And we live in a time that's given up 
on what we call absolute truth. That no one can definitively say anything is absolutely true. In fact, um, this is not a scientific survey, but a, a survey of, uh, of college students um, came up with this. Uh, in an interview conducted at a large university, people were asked if there was such a thing as absolute truth defined by this. Truth that is true across all times and all cultures for all people. And all but one person interviewed answered along these lines. Something like, truth is whatever you believe. There is no absolute truth. If there were such a thing as absolute truth, how could we know what it is? And then finally, many of them responded in this way. People who believe in absolute truth are dangerous. You see, we live in a time that says, if you try to tell me what is true for me, it makes you dangerous in my sight. In fact, John Piper said this about that idea of no absolute truth. He says, it's a world in which his message, talking about Jesus, has been nullified even before it's spoken because truth is seen, and I love this phrase, truth is the rotten root of bigotry and intolerance and prejudice. But he answers that with relativism, on the other hand, is seen as the wholesome mother of cultural respect and tolerance and peace. You see, tolerance is our cultural mantra today. You can be anything you want to be. Just don't be intolerant. But see, it occurs to me that tolerance doesn't go far enough for me to look at you and go, you know, you decide for you what's true. You decide for what's important for you and I won't get involved. And that way I'm not responsible for you. I'm just responsible for me. But the Bible calls us to a much higher standard than that. It's not that our, the Bible calls us to be intolerant. The Bible calls us to love for one another. The Bible calls us to share the truth, to testify to the truth, to point to Jesus Christ. Now you remember weeks ago when we shared about when Jesus says, whoever believes in me will have springs of living water well up in them. That if we drink deeply from the cup of Christ, we are cleansed of our sins. We have a need that we can't pay, a debt that's owed that I don't have the resources to pay before God. But on the other hand, the world offers something different. The world offers you drink whatever you choose to drink. But the difference in that is this. If absolutely true that there is only one way to God, that Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me, this is the cup of salvation. And if this were a cup of poison, it's what the world drinks. We'll sip on any old thing that's offered to us. And if that is a true statement that this is life and this is death and you raise this glass to drink it, how much would I have to hate you to allow you to drink it in ignorance? <laughs> Tolerance says you drink whatever you want to drink. Love says there is only one cup that leads to salvation. Is there a difference in that? We're not called to hate people. We're not called to judge people in a way that condemns them without offering the hope of the living water. It's been John's purpose in his gospel to say that he's written these things so that you may know that Jesus is the Son of God and the Messiah, and by believing in him, you may have life. Why is that necessary? Because the only alternative is death. And if that's the choice, what possibly could we do except to share the truth, the absolute, unchangeable, eternal truth of Jesus Christ? I saw a video some years ago. Uh, you may recognize this name. There's a man by the name of Penn Gillette. He's part of the magic and comedy team of Penn and Teller. You've probably seen him on TV. Penn Gillette is an avowed atheist. We had an experience at um, a show he was doing in Las Vegas, and after the show, a man approached him and said, I really admire your work. I'm entertained by it. And he said, could I 
do something for you. I want to give you a gift. And he reached into his pocket and he pulled out a little Gideon New Testament. I think it was a Gideon one. Um, and he said, could I just give you this Bible? It's something that's important to me and I'd like to share it with you. And he thanked the man and he took it. When he got home, he opened up his computer and he does what's called a video blog. He just, instead of writing down his thoughts, he records them and posts them on the internet. And you can go and find this um, blog of his there. But he says several things in that. He says, I don't believe what that Bible has to say, but it occurs to me that this man had great love in his heart. But then he goes on to say the other side of the coin is this. He says, I mean, if I believed beyond a shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe that that truck was bearing down on you, there's a certain point where I tackle you. And this is more important than that. This Bible was more important to that man. And then he says these words that pierce your heart like a knife. He says, how much do you have to hate somebody to believe everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? You see, Jesus stood before Pontius Pilate and he asked him these questions. Are you the king of the Jews and what is truth? And that question comes from our own hearts this day and every day. Is Jesus who he claims that he is? Is he the king of the Jews? Is he the Messiah? Is he the son of God who's come to earth, who lived and died for the remission of your sins to usher us into all eternity with God or is he not? And ultimately, is that true? Is the Bible accurate in what it says? And is our faith resting on something that is true in Jesus' day and every day since? Or is it a lie? It's a question that Pilate asked and he was a skeptic. He doesn't believe in it. In fact, we'll find next week, he literally washes his hands of the whole thing and says, I've decided not to decide. But in doing that, haven't you really made an eternal decision? To say, I don't know who Jesus is, still leaves us without the living water. And so our message is simple today. Treachery is carried out against the name of Jesus every day. And it's carried out in our own hearts often. When we reject and we deny Jesus Christ, it doesn't change the truth of his having given his life for us. And I hope our takeaway from this is what a preacher from the 1900s, um, early 1900s named J.C. Ryle wrote, the highest form of selfishness is that of a man who is content to go to heaven alone. Can we be encouraged this day that Jesus is the King? Anybody who says he didn't claim to that has not read John chapter 18. It is as you say, I am the King of the Jews. And if Jesus is the King, the true King, then he is to be believed, he is to be obeyed, and he surely has to be shared with those around us. Can we testify to the truth and the claims of Jesus Christ as the King of kings and Lord of lords today and every day. Can we pray? Our Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for life and for salvation that comes only through Jesus, our eternal King. We thank you that His Lordship goes forward in His kingdom on this earth and in the heavens. And we pray that this day that our hearts would be turned to Christ, that if we've never given ourselves fully to trust in Jesus Christ for our own salvation, that today would be the day that the work of the Holy Spirit would take place in us to bring us into the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And so we acknowledge and we worship and we praise Jesus as our King. And I pray that we would testify through what we say and what we do and how we live our lives that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one can come to the Father except through Him. We give glory to Christ in that this day. In Jesus' name, amen.